Let me pray for us and we'll start our time. Heavenly Father, thank you so much for this morning. What a privilege it is to come again on a Sunday morning and ponder an empty tomb, the conquering of death, the defeat of that last enemy, uh, by none other than you, Lord Jesus, who conquered death not only for yourself, but for your people whom you came to save. And we give you praise for being God, for being a man, for being our Savior, uh, for being victorious over death, for granting life to all who believe. And we pray now as we study death this morning from your word, that our perspective would be recalibrated to the truth, um, to even the ways that you desire for us to talk about death as believers. And we pray to have your heart in it, in Jesus' name, amen. All right, this morning we are continuing our study of thanatology. Uh, thanos, thanatos, uh, the word for death, uh, a, a modern cartoon character, but a, but a Greek word. And so thanatology is the study of death. And, and what we're doing in Equipping Hour last week and this week is the study of death through the lens of Jesus rewriting the vocabulary of death. Paul says, in thinking about Christian victory over death through Christ, O oh, death, where is your victory? Where is your sting? And we might say this morning, based on the way Jesus reframes the thinking about death for a believer, O oh, death, where is your vocabulary? Uh, what we'll see is, is that Jesus changes the language of death in the New Testament for believers. And I believe that starts in the New Testament narratives. It starts in the Gospels. And, and we're looking at John chapter 11 and the scene of Jesus raising Lazarus from the dead. And before he gets to the tomb where Lazarus is, he, he meets Martha outside of town. And he says to her these twin statements, John 11, 25 and 26, he says, I am the resurrection and the life. He who believes in me will live even if he dies, and everyone who lives and believes in me will never die, ever. Do you believe this? And these twin statements that believers will never die, and that believers will live even when they die, don't seem to go together until we begin to unpack a New Testament theology of death. What is the believer's relationship to death? And so uh, we have up on the screen there the points we covered last week. And, and we discovered a number of realities related to death. And the notes are available on the web under equipping hour posted on last week's message. And I think there's some 18 pages of notes or something. So uh, don't destroy your, your, uh, your tendons uh, trying to write everything down, all of these notes are available there for you. But we learned from last week that unbelievers are dead. Unbelievers are born dead. They are dead spiritually, dead in their transgressions and sins. We, we saw a number of ways in which unbelievers start out as dead. Uh, their works are dead. Uh, they are unable to please God in their spiritual death. Uh, that is universal. We also discovered that believers will, unbelievers, excuse me, will die. Uh, they will die a physical death on top of already being born spiritually dead. And we learned also that unbelievers will die again. There is something the Bible calls the second death. Uh, that is, after your physical mortality, if you die in unbelief, you face the second death, which is the lake of fire. Uh, there is a judgment to be made by Jesus, an assessment of life, which results in conscious eternal torment. Fourthly, we learned that if you're a believer in Jesus Christ, though you were born spiritually dead, an event happened called new birth that is also called in the New Testament, death which is a strange and paradoxical description. But we discover very quickly in reading the New Testament that the language of death and dying, the, the, the common words for death in the New Testament, are applied more often to believers' new birth than to their physical mortality. Believers are said to die, yes. They're said to be killed, yes. But the, that comes in contexts of persecution and suffering. 
When those words are applied to believers, most often they are applied to passages like Romans 6 and Galatians 2. I have been crucified with Christ. In other words, when I believed in Jesus, I died. There is an old man and a new man. There is one crucified existence that means being uh, having died with Christ, being buried with him, and now raised to newness of life. It means being crucified to the world. That, that language of, of death and even co-crucifixion has to do with the believer's new birth. And then we discovered, number five, that eternal life begins at new birth. That when someone believes in Jesus Christ, John 5, 24, he becomes a present and ongoing possessor of this life which is called eternal. And eternal life deals not only with a duration of life, but a kind of life, a quality of life, a life that is from above, supernatural life, spirit wrought life. It's called eternal life. And the day you are born again, the moment you believe in Jesus Christ savingly, you are a possessor of eternal life. And even there, we get to see a hint of the reality that that eternal life transcends your physical mortality without interruption. And we begin to see that the way we normally think of death starts to melt away, even in the de definition and description of eternal life given to a believer. And then we learn, sixthly, that a believer's life is a kind of death. A dying to self, a putting to death the deeds of the body, a, uh, this idea of, of self-mortification, the idea of taking up one's cross and following Christ daily. This is a description of the Christian life, a, a kind of dying. And it's just interesting to see the way the New Testament uses this death language that changes at new birth. We're going to move on this morning to a few other realities. Let's look at number seven. Believers still face physical death. Believers still face physical death. We don't take Jesus' statement to Martha in John 11 to mean that believers escape physical mortality. When Jesus says, he who lives and believes in me will never die ever, uh, we could be tempted to doubt Jesus' words when we face our own mortality or when a loved one who knows Christ dies. What is Jesus talking about here? The reality is believers still face physical death, and we need to place an asterisk here. The asterisk, the footnote, is unless the rapture. Right? John 14, 1 to 3, Jesus said, I go to prepare a place for you in my Father's house or many mansions. If it were not so, I would have told you, but I go to prepare a place for you, and I will come for you and take you to be with me so that you will be with me where I am. Jesus will return, and there will be a generation of believers who experience Jesus meeting them in the air and returning to that dwelling place, that abode that he's been preparing, that heavenly Jerusalem, the house in God's house that transcends the cosmos. Jesus will come for his own and take them there, and they will bypass death. This is the truth laid out in 1 Thessalonians 4 and in 1 Corinthians 15. In the twinkling of an eye, we will be transformed. Not all of us will sleep, Paul says, but we will be changed. In 1 Thessalonians 4, we have the order of events. The dead in Christ shall rise first, and then those who are alive and remain will meet him in the air, and we will always be with him. So there's the footnote. There is a generation of believers who will not face physical mortality, though they have walked around in a decaying body, they will not see its finality. They will not experience what 1 Corinthians 15 describes as being buried in weakness, being 
buried in shame, ignominy, the, the, the lowest point of physicality that a human body can endure. There will be a generation of believers who bypass all of that. And that's an encouragement. But for every believer who has gone home so far, and perhaps for all of us, there is a facing of physical mortality, of death. And death is called an enemy in 1 Corinthians 15, 52. It is the last enemy. And at a very real level, death is wrong. There, there is something so terribly off about death. Humanity was designed and created by God to be an entity that is both physical and non-physical. Material and immaterial, corporeal or bodily, and spiritual. We were designed that way, inside and out. Man was meant to be an integrated whole. And, and you know there is a relationship between your spirit and your physicality. You know that the, the things that happen in your physicality, in your physical body, affect your spirit and vice versa. And death is the disintegration of that entity. It is the separating out of the material and immaterial of the human frame. Death is unnatural in the sense that it is not the nature which God created humanity to have. And we know this is true, obviously, in the Garden of Eden. We know this is true in our own experience. But it is true even into eternity, both for the forgiven and the unforgiven. Everyone will exist forever. And in the eternal state, every single human being will exist in body and spirit. There is a resurrection unto life, and there is a resurrection unto shame and judgment. Humanity was designed to be bodily and spiritual. Death is the separation of those things, the disintegration. And so at a very real level, it is wrong. Death is also a separation, not only of the individual human, of his immaterial and material self. Death is also the separation of relationships. In fact, the Bible calls hell a separation from God. It's not the only thing the Bible describes hell as. Hell is also the very real presence of God and His holy justice. Revelation 12 tells us that those who are in the lake of fire who have taken the, the, the beast's number and mark will face eternal torment and the smoke rises forever in the presence of the Lamb and His holy angels. What makes hell so awful is that God is there. But Paul says to the Thessalonians, what makes hell so awful is that God is not there. Which again seems like perhaps a contradiction in the Bible until you think for a moment about the cross, a, a very real example that described both the presence of God in His wrath, the Father crushing His Son, and the dereliction of, God, of Jesus as God abandons His Son on the cross. He cries out, why have you forsaken me? You have there the abdication of God's presence in His goodness and the very presence of God in His anger against sin. Such will be the lake of fire. But it is right to think of death as a separation of relationships. When those who face eternal judgment and the second death when they meet Christ and their lives are assessed, they will be told things like this, depart from me, you accursed ones. Depart from me, for I never knew you. They will be told, go away. And it is like that tragic scene in the Garden of Eden when sin had made a separation between Adam and Eve and the goodness of God and His presence of walking in the garden in the cool of the day. In fact, after they sinned, they, they were told they had to leave the garden and they could not get back in. And, and God placed the cherubim with a flaming sword to bar the doors. And the rest of the Bible is the story of how do we get back in? Sin has made a separation. 
Prophet Isaiah made this clear in Isaiah 59. It is not as though God's hand is so short that he cannot save. It is not as though his ears are so dull that he cannot hear, but your sins have made a separation between you and your God, and there's blood on your hands. Death is rightfully a separator of relationships between creatures and their maker. And tragically, sadly, grievously, death is a separator of relationships here on this earth. You've experienced it. You, you know what it means to have known somebody, to have loved somebody, to speak with somebody, to, to think the next moment you're, you're going to see them again and be able to say what you'd like to say, and, and then they're gone. And, and that chasm of separation is unbreachable and, in many cases, unbearable. Death brings a sadness and a sorrow that is just not right. Just as man was designed by God to be an entity, immaterial and material together, inseparable forever, so He has designed humanity to be a corporate entity together, enjoying fellowship, not in isolation, but a, but a family, a, a group of people together, and, and death cuts that off and separates it. Death is a grievous tyranny brought into the world by sin that must one day be made right. When you think about the new heavens and the new earth, the, the eternal state where all things are made right, looking back on the previous era, all previous eras, God calls those things the first things. The eternal state is the second things, the new things, the forever things, and in that set of new realities, there is no death. Until then, it is a tyranny, and it is universal, and it is consequential. Listen to 2 Corinthians 4.16. We do not lose heart, though our outer man is decaying, yet our inner man is being renewed day by day. Paul grapples with the reality that even for believers, there is present physical decay. The body breaks down. It is a reminder of sin's universality and its consequences. We feel it every day. If, if you're riding the roller coaster of your physicality up towards 19 years old and that apex, you may think this is strange language. Otherwise, you know the reality. And as the roller coaster crosses that apex and heads downhill, it, it accelerates, doesn't it? That outer decay is real. Romans 14, 7 to 9 uses death language for a believer. Not one of us lives for himself, Paul writes. Not one of us dies for himself. If we live, we live for the Lord. If we die, we die for the Lord. Therefore, whether we live or die, we are the Lord's. For to this end, Christ died and lived again, that He might be Lord both of the dead and the living. And here, breaking from the new vocabulary we'll get to in point eight, we're getting there. <laughs> this break from the, the way Paul talks about the relationship or Jesus or the rest of the New Testament talk about the new relationship for the believer in death seems to emphasize the suffering of what physical mortality is for the believer. And we can't lose sight of that. Even as we reframe our vocabulary about death, we, we don't make it smaller than it is because the suffering is real. As we weep with those who weep, as we give comfort to those who are facing death, we don't shy away from the physical realities of it. It is awful and it is wrong. And, and the New Testament picture faces up to that. Listen to Romans 8.38. Again, this is a context of persecution. I am convinced that neither death, nor life, nor angels, nor principalities, nor things present, nor things to come, nor powers will be able to separate us from the love of God which is in Christ Jesus. How do we know that's the context of persecution? Because in the next verse, Paul goes on to say, for your sakes, we were being handed over to death all day long. We are sheep to be slaughtered. 
He recognizes the vulnerability of Christians to a persecuting world that can culminate in mortality. We talked about this in that following Jesus is a kind of dying, take up your cross and follow me, may actually cost you your physical life. But think about the implication for Romans 8.38, for your last breath. Paul says, I am convinced that death will not be able to separate us from the love of God in Christ Jesus. What does that mean? As, as you cross the river Styx, as you breathe your last breath, as you close your eyes for the last time and, and your handhold on a loved one, let's go you are never let go of by Christ. You cannot be separated from the love of God which has you in His firm grip, even at that threshold. And so it is right to think of even something so awful and dark and bleak and scary as death as a doorway, as a doorway that a believer walks through being held onto by the love grip of God. And friends, that is a tremendous comfort. You need to know that as you approach that moment. You need to be thinking those thoughts as that hour draws near. And we need to help one another think those thoughts. That's the truth. That's part of the recalibration. It doesn't shy away from the awful reality of what death is. It is an enemy. It is an enemy that must die. And yet, it has been fundamentally changed. Philippians 1.20 says, According to my earnest expectation, I hope that I will not be put to shame in anything, but that with all boldness, Christ will now, as always, be exalted in my body, whether by life or by death. What does Paul want? to give glory to Christ in his death. Again, the the death language is used in this context to depict the suffering, the hardship, the, the darkest moments of our earthly existence. In 1 Thessalonians 4, believers are called the dead in Christ. Hebrews 11, 13 describes Old Testament saints who died in faith. And of course, Romans 8, 28 tells us that God works all things for good to those who love Him and are called according to His purpose. So even as we see the sort of normal death language around the life of a believer in the New Testament, often in context of persecution and suffering, we also see that God is working all things, which includes the enemy called death, for our good We cling to that reality. It is for our good that death is still a part of the equation. In God's economy, in God's working out of redemptive history, this is one of His goods, even though it is by its own nature bad. And here's how we know the power of the sovereignty of God who loves believers. When God is so in charge of bad things, that he makes enemies become the believer's friend, God's in charge and he's good. What do we have to fear if we fear the Lord? All right, let's move to number eight. This is really where we're headed from these twin statements in John eleven twenty five 25, and 26. We begin there in the Gospel of John to see Jesus rewriting death language. And I just want to highlight for you 45 or so euphemisms in the New Testament, where the death language is not the normal words for death we would see, not the ones we've covered so far, but but new ways to describe it. And I use the word euphemisms in quotation marks, air quotes up here, real quotes in the notes on the web, because euphemism isn't the right word. Euphemism is a word you use to make something bad look a little prettier. You're, you're whitewashing a sepulcher. Uh, you're, you're, you're painting a nice picture of, of something dirty. 
that's not what I mean here, right? I mean, Jesus actually is changing the way we frame the idea of death. He's not painting niceties over what's uncomfortable to make us feel a little bit better without changing the thing. No, he actually changed the thing and the vocabulary follows suit. Let's just listen to these a little bit. While the unbeliever walks around physically alive but spiritually dead, the believer in Jesus Christ walks around in newness of life, eternal life, life in Christ, life that never ends. Already at the beginning of the definition of of a present possessor of eternal life, the language has changed. Paul says in 1 Corinthians 5.10, in describing the death of a believer, he calls it going out of this world. Going out of this world. That's a a remarkable phrase. Um, Hey, where where did so-and-so go? (laughs) Haven't seen him around for a while. Yeah, he he went out of this world. (laughs) What? He left. He has left the building. It's true. It's geographically true. That's not a euphemism. That's the reality. Probably the most common rephrasing is just the word sleep. Paul uses this in 1 Corinthians 11. An interesting context where he's describing Believers at Corinth who were misappropriating the Lord's table, who were not judging the body correctly, and some got sick and some slept. What what does Paul mean by that? Um, He means they died. And it's an interesting phrase to describe. This word sleep for death is never used of unbelievers anywhere in the New Testament. Which is one clue that the believers at, that the people at Corinth referred to there were, were believers in Christ, but who were judged. Their, their earthly lives were cut shorter than they otherwise would have because they weren't turning from a wrong view of things. And unless 1 Corinthians 11 is the exception to the rule, um, every use of sleep for, a, for uh, death in the New Testament is a reference to believers who are no longer here. And it is not a, not a doctrine of soul sleep. If you've heard of the doctrine of soul sleep, that you just sort of go into a coma until resurrection day. Uh, you don't know what's going on. You're just sort of unconscious. And you wait around except without knowing that you're waiting around for the end. Um, soul sleep is not a biblical doctrine. Uh, we know that from several examples. What did Jesus say to the thief on the cross? After you're done soul sleeping, you'll find me in paradise. No, he says, today you will be with me in paradise. What does Paul say about his own departure? We'll get to it in a moment. Absent from the body is what? Present with the Lord. Why this illustration of sleep? What is it saying if it's not talking about some sort of comatose state? It's referring to the way we view things from here. Typically, when you sleep, you're horizontal. Usually. If you've fallen asleep driving a car, that's bad. That's not how it's supposed to work. You should be in bed. When we see somebody who's sleeping, their eyes are closed and they're horizontal and they're not moving, they're not talking, uh, they're not responding. Uh, That's a a visual representation of, okay, there's a body, horizontal, eyes closed, not talking, not responsive. But they still exist. They're still alive. That's the import of that picture. And from our vantage point, they sleep, but, but absent from the body present with the Lord, very much awake, very much alive, without the bodily resurrection yet, uh, but still in bliss in the Lord's presence. 1 Corinthians 13, 3, Paul is speaking in hypotheticals. Uh, he's saying, if I speak with the tongues of angels, if I do this, not that, I give everything away. But he also says, if I surrender my body to be burned. Well, that's interesting. 
Go back and read the, the, the Marian Martyrs in the 1550s in England, or, or maybe go to downtown London and see the little plaque where they would rather die in fire out of loyalty to Christ than surrender the truth. These were brave heroes, and, and, and many martyrs have died by fire. How does Paul describe death there? Ah, surrender your body. It, surrender. What, what do you... I don't need this anymore. I'm just, just going to give it up. I, I have no use of that. <laughs> I'm, I'm leaving. I, I'm going out of this world. Uh, you'll think of me perhaps as asleep, but I don't need this body anymore. Surrender it. And listen, you, you, you may be farther down that roller coaster past 19 years old, uh, of age and uh, the prime of physicality. You might be readier to surrender this thing than others. Maybe more ready than you were last week or 10 years ago or decades ago. But the reality is when you breathe your last on the earth, it can rightly be called surrendering your body. It's not death. It's not a going out of existence. It, 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 it's not a separation from God. Not death in any of those senses, but is the end of your use of this decaying physicality, this one that is subject to corruption. The fourth so-called euphemism is what Paul describes in 1 Corinthians 13, 12. He talks about seeing and knowing, and there's a now and a later and whether that refers to the presence of Christ or the fullness of knowledge in the New Testament era is uh, something of, of the debate. But the reality is there is a seeing and a knowing Christ, which is the definition of eternal life. Jesus defined eternal life in John 17, 3, as knowing him whom you've sent. He actually prayed to the Father that the disciples, his followers, would see his glory. What does it mean to leave this world? It means to know Him, see Him face to face, to be in His presence. The imagery in 1 Corinthians 15 is the farming imagery of planting seeds. The mortal body is said to be sown. Uh, a farmer sows his seeds, he either broadcasts them by throwing them out over the dirt or he places them carefully in the ground. Jesus said, unless a seed dies, then you can't have life afterwards with the plant and bear fruit. This, the imagery is applied to believers' death in 1 Corinthians 15. What is sown in the ground properly belongs to that which will emerge later. We know that if you plant a, a, a seed of an orange tree in the ground, you're not likely to get watermelons. There's some resemblance, but a watermelon seed doesn't look like a vine, and a watermelon seed doesn't look like a watermelon. But it is clear that there is a connection between those two. So the physicality of who you are now, buried into the ground, has some connection to you, but the difference between the, what you will look like then and what you'll look like now is the difference between weakness and power between natural and supernatural, between dishonor and glory. It's going to be dramatic. And it's interesting that death in that language is just called, ah, sowing seeds. What does a farmer think about when he's sowing seeds? Death, 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 more death. He's thinking about life and production and fruit and vitality and hope. It's interesting imagery. What happened to Smed? He got sown. <laughs> Number six is the contrast in 1 Corinthians 15 to the earthy and the heavenly. Again, that seed is sown. We have borne the image of the earthy. We will bear the image of the heavenly. It's an interesting contrast. 1 Corinthians 15, 50 describes leaving this world and going to the next as inheriting the kingdom of God and inheriting the imperishable. 
You, you go out of the world where things fall apart into the world where they don't. 1 Corinthians 15, 51 has the simple phrase, we will be changed. Okay, that's a, a reference to the resurrection rapture moment. But in terms of thinking about what it means to leave this behind, every believer eventually will experience that resurrection and be changed. Be changed. Paul says in 1 Corinthians 15, 53, we will put on the imperishable. It's the language of clothing. You, you, you take off of that which is decaying and decomposing and falling apart, and you put on, like a robe, like a new set of garments, that which can never fall apart, the imperishable. 1 Corinthians 15, 53 also says, we will put on immortality. Put it on, again, like clothing. In 2 Corinthians 4, 16, Paul says our outer man is decaying. Yeah, that's another way to describe your physical mortality. Just the final state of that outer man decay. 2 Corinthians 5, 1, Paul describes physical mortality for a believer as the tent being torn down. A tent being torn down. Maybe you've been camping. Maybe you despise camping. We grew up camping in my family, backpacking, wilderness adventures, sleeping on the ground. Um, my parents always had these inflatable air mattresses that uh, regulated the temperature and comfort while the kids slept on the rocks. It's the way of things. And when you're young, you can do that better. Um, my sister has a, a luggage tag on her suitcase that says, I love not camping. So we shared the same experiences in many tents over the years growing up. Um, her views on camping are different than mine. Living in a tent is wonderful. For a night, a couple days, a week, if you're really adventurous, at high altitude, in the cold, with bad food, no sleep, it's great. Man, you make memories. No matter how much you don't like or do like camping, when it's time to roll up the tent and you start thinking about a hot meal and a good shower, fresh set of clothes, oh man, isn't that great? That's part of the great things about camping is stopping camping. It's one of the reasons you do it. What a great imagery for living here in this life. You're, you're not home. This is not your permanent dwelling. Uh, this is a, a canvas covering that, that doesn't quite suit. It's nomadic. It's temporary. It's, it's not solid. It can be torn down, folded up, rolled up, put away. It can fall apart. I saw a video this week of people trying to set up their tents at a campground on a, on a ridge line in the Appalachian Mountains. And the wind came, the tent went like a kite. <laughs> How would you describe your home going? Ah, his tent got torn down. What do you mean he's done camping? He's done with the nomadic journey? He's off to good food? He's going home? That's right. That's a good picture. In the next phrase, in 2 Corinthians 5, verse 21, Paul describes a believer's home going as acquiring our building from God. That's a contrast to the tent. It is solid. It is permanent. It is built by God. It, 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 it didn't go up with the sort of the, the flimsy attempt at, man, where's the instruction manual for this thing? Where do these poles go? Oh, I... I ripped it. God has done this. He has built it. It's permanent and it's designed for eternal permanence. It's a great way to describe physical mortality. Oh, what happened to her? Oh, she acquired her building from God. 2 Corinthians 5.2 gives this one, being clothed with our dwelling from heaven. 
again, the imagery of, of clothing, of putting on new clothing. What do we put on when we die as believers? We put on our permanent residence. We put on our heavenly dwelling. 2 Corinthians 5.3 describes this as being no longer naked. 2 Corinthians 5.4 as being clothed. And this one's my favorite. 2 Corinthians 5.4. Paul says, what is mortal shall be swallowed up by life. Oh. I'm wearing my favorite socks. They're the ones with the great white shark. With its giant bloody maw and sharp teeth. Chasing prey, maybe humans, makes a good story. Terrifying reality. What would it mean to be swallowed up by something? But what gets swallowed up and what's doing the swallowing? Mortality, deathiness gets chewed up by the jaws of life. <laughs> it's a remarkable imagery, swallowed up by it. Overwhelming. 2 Corinthians 5, 8, and 9, Paul talks about being absent from the body. Existing, alive, somewhere, but absent from the body. That one, that one is a positive when we think about a, a decaying corpse. But it's negative in the sense of the ongoing effects of that disintegration we talked about. Death separates body and soul. Man is not made to be forever bodiless. God has designed humans not to be ministering spirits like angels, not to be mere physicality like the animals, not to be merely in existence like the rocks and the stars, but to be something unique to have physicality and spirituality integrated into one. And so absent from the body is good news in the sense of, yes, that believer still exists, is in the grip of God, is, is with God in his presence, and he's waiting. Paul doesn't have his physical body yet, and he wrote this almost 2,000 years ago. Those believers who have gone home before us don't yet have their physical bodies. That awaits the 1 Corinthians 15, 1 Thessalonians 4, John 14, resurrection, rapture event. It's coming, but they're waiting. So this absent from the body is, is joyful rewriting of the vocabulary of death for a believer. And it comes with this tinge of anticipation and hope for a still yet future. I love 2 Corinthians 5, 8, and 9. Very Simply, absent from the body is to be at home with the Lord. I love referring to a believer's death as a homegoing. Absent from the body, present with the Lord, that is home. In Philippians 1, Paul talks about his own demise as departing. To depart and be with Christ, he says. A departure. We think about a departure like... I'm going on vacation. When's your departure? Oh, yeah, I'm looking forward to going somewhere. Do you, do you ever think about the termination of your physical existence that way? When's your departure? I don't know. I got a ticket. It's an interesting way to describe it. To depart and to be with Christ, Philippians 1, 23. He goes on to say that's very much better. Very much better than what? Very much better than remaining on here, which is, which is what we, we tend to want to cling to so hard. Now, Paul clinging to that in Philippians 1 was rooted and grounded in fruitful ministry and a benefit to the Philippians. Paul was in jail. You might expect an escapist mentality from a guy who was suffering. And he said, you know, to remain on for you right now, I think is better. I think I'm going to stay. Not that he had a choice. He's just trying to assess what's God going to do with me here. I think he recognized he, he would still be fruitful in remaining. We don't know what God's going to do with us. Sometimes there's greater fruit in our departure. But Paul said it's better to depart and be with Christ. Better than staying. In our non-Pauline, non-servant-minded, non-big-hearted, I love the Philippian believers so much that I think my suffering can encourage them if I stay here and suffer more. 
But in our materialistic, naturalistic, American quest for the idolatry of youthiness mindset, we just want to be healthy and comfortable and stay here as long as we can. That's not biblical. That has to be rewritten. We have to actually undo that programming and say, to be with Christ is better. And to remain, more suffering, more service, more love for others, fruitful. That's a, that's a different way to think about it. Paul talks about the dead in Christ in 1 Thessalonians 4.16. And while this does use one of the normal death words, not one of the euphemistic vocabulary words, the, the location of this word dead within Christ makes it nice. It, if you are a believer who faces physical mortality, where are you? What is your location? You are in Christ. You were in Christ while you walked the earth, and you are in Christ in your departure. That never changed. We have got to speed up. I'm going to read through the rest of these. Paul describes departure from this life for a believer as being poured out as a drink offering. Pleasing sacrifice to the Lord. As living together with Him, 1 Thessalonians 5.10. Again, as a departure in 2 Timothy 4. He talks in 2 Timothy 4 of having fought the good fight, having finished the course, having kept the faith. And so the imagery there is something like a boxing match that's done. The final bell rang. The, 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 the tape at the end of the race got cut. In other words, victory, completion, finishing, finishing well. That's what he had in mind. 2 Timothy 4, 8, he talks about being rescued from every evil deed. Church history tells us that Paul was a victim of the Neronian persecution. The Roman Emperor Nero, who lit up Christians on poles as torches for his nighttime garden parties, probably had Paul beheaded. How does Paul describe looking forward to, to uh, the imprisonment he was in that, that likely terminated in his execution? He talks about being rescued. How would he be rescued? The same way John the Baptist was rescued from evil deeds. And then the next phrase, 2 Timothy 4.18, he says, God will bring me safely to his heavenly kingdom. We don't think about death as safety. We think about physical mortality as the exact opposite of safety. Not Paul. It's an airplane crashes and... and uh, a losing battle with cancer are not what the world calls safe. But God does if you're a believer. Paul described it that way as being brought safely home. Possible reference to, to a believer's death in Hebrews 13, 13 is going outside the camp to be with Jesus. Hebrews 13, 14 talks about seeking the city which is to come. First Peter describes the time of your stay on earth. What are you doing here? Ah, it's just a stay for a time. What are you doing next? <laughs> That's the rest. I'll be home. Peter talks about in 1 Peter 4, 2, the rest of the time in the flesh. What is your life now? We think our life is here right now. No, your real life is hidden with Christ in God. When he's revealed, you'll be revealed with him. And so, what, what are your days and moments here? It's just the rest of your time in the flesh. Your life, eternal life that began at new birth, goes on forever and ever and ever and ever and ever. A few years ago at a, a GBC summer camp, I, I took out a, a, a spool of, of, thread, of yarn, twine. That was the word I was looking for. And I had on that, that uh, large spool of, of twine a a little segment of it marked with a red Sharpie marker. And the, the length of twine of that Sharpie marker that was red was about that long. I took the ball of twine, passed it up and down the rows. The students threw it around. Um, they probably made more out of the illustration than I had intended, but 
Uh, the last student who had the ball of twine ran out the back door and threw it as far as he could. And the idea is that twine is your life. And, and if we had an infinite ball of twine and wrapped it around the earth a million times and, and out past the edges of the, the solar system and back a million more times, and then from our solar system to all the distant pulsars and quasars at the edge of the known universe, and did that a thousand times, and then did laps around all of it with that infinite ball of twine, we would not begin to touch eternity. And that twine is your life. The little red part, that big, is the part of your life here on this earth. So when Peter talks about the, the rest of your days in the flesh, he, he's talking about this. First Peter talks about entrusting our souls to a faithful creator. Let that phrase sink in in those last breaths. The last time you close your eyes. The last time you grip a hand or, or listen to someone reading scripture or praying for you. And trust your soul to a faithful creator. Peter describes believers being perfected, confirmed, strengthened, and established. It's a good way to describe going home. Entrance into the eternal kingdom. Laying aside the earthly dwelling. Overcoming being made to stand in the presence of His glory, coming out of the great tribulation for those tribulation martyrs. What happens when they die? Oh, they're just said to leave. They came out of the tribulation. <laughs> Book of Revelation also calls the death of believers the perseverance and faith of the saints. That's why the Book of Revelation four, chapter 14 says, Blessed or happy are the dead who die in the Lord. They have rest from their labors. The death language, aside from general statements about what death is or specific statements about persecution, martyrdom, the death language when spoken of a Christian is far more often spoken about his new birth than about his physical mortality. And so we can cry out, oh death, where is your vocabulary? It just gets changed by the realities of the way Jesus changes death. Paul can say, Philippians 1.21, to die is gain. It's better by far. Paul says in 2 Corinthians 5.8, we are of good courage, we prefer rather to be absent from the body and be home with the Lord. There's a final reality we have to look at, and it is that death itself will die. Death itself will die. Uh, that great last enemy will itself perish in death. Acts 2.24, God raised Jesus up again, putting an end to the agony of death since it was impossible for him to be held in its power. Jesus is stronger than death. Romans 6, 9, Jesus, having been raised from the dead, is never to die again. Death is no longer master over him. Jesus is in charge. 1 Corinthians 15, 26, the last enemy that will be brought to naught, it will be abolished, is death. 1 Corinthians 15, 54, when this imperishable will have put on imperishable, the mortal will have put on immortality, then will come about the saying, death is swallowed up in victory. O oh, death, where is your victory? O oh, death, where is your sting? The sting of death is sin, the power of sin is the law, but thanks be to God who gives us the victory through our Lord Jesus Christ. Hebrews 2, 14 and 15. Therefore, since the children share in flesh and blood, he himself likewise also partook of the same, that through death he might render powerless him who had the power of death, that is the devil, and he might free those who through fear of death were subject to slavery all their lives. Revelation 1, 18. I am the living one, Jesus says, and I was dead. And behold, I am very much alive, and I have the keys of death and Hades. So Jesus is stronger than death. Jesus is in charge. 
And in Revelation 20, 14, then death and Hades were thrown into the lake of fire, into this second death. Death itself thrown into death. Revelation 21, 4, the new heavens and new earth, after the first things have passed away, he will wipe away every tear from their eyes. There will no longer be any death. The first things have passed away. All of this changes our relationship to death because Jesus experienced death for us who believe. Death is destingered, reworked, repurposed. And you can rightly tell your own testimony of this like this. I died when I was in grade school. After that, I attended junior high. I went on to high school, to college, to graduate school. I got married, had five kids. And soon I'll go home. Whatever the details of your story, you have, in fact, a better testimony than Lazarus. Have you thought about how cool it would be to say, after four days, I stinketh. <laughs> and this voice, dead men don't normally hear things. I heard a voice and I, I walked out. And they had to take the bandages off my face. And then I went around telling everybody and they tried to kill me for it. And you say, cool story, bro. <laughs> and friends, yours is better. Lazarus' resurrection was a physical and temporary one. Yours is an eternal one that transcends physical mortality. For those of us who remain and grieve the loss of a believer, we only mourn a temporary loss. And we don't grieve as the world does. The world either goes hopeless or empty wishes. We have truth. So we lament the loss of an unbeliever. That is a loss of infinite tragedy. We take comfort in the goodness of God, a goodness of God we will not fully comprehend in this life, but a goodness that is shown over and over again to be unfailing. Listen, at my funeral, um, you can use any of the phrases that the New Testament employs to describe the home going of a believer. Uh, anything that would recalibrate listeners' understanding about, about our death and Maybe you can combine a few and say something like this. He has left the land of the dying and has gone safely home. Let's pray. Lord, thank you for winning. Thank you for your victory over this mortal enemy. Thank you for the way this changes everything for us. It, it changes not only our final moments, but it changes the way we live every moment. Would you be glorified in us, whether by life or by death, for your honor, for your fame. In the name of your son, Jesus.